on? I am. I am? Yes, I am. So I want to take this moment to thank Marcia Dawson for this beautiful altar this morning. Um, it's really gorgeous. And this might be a representation of one of the kinds of time that I'm going to be talking about this morning with the candles and the orchids. And when you step into this experience, you're more engaged with the experience of the altar than you are with how much time passes as we count it. So just think about that a little bit. We come back into the, uh, the discussion of time. I want to say good morning to everybody who's joining us online this morning. I'm happy to be here for Reverend Carol Huntley. I'm not Reverend Carol Huntley. I'm Reverend Mary Marie Shelton. I didn't give Joyce a chance to say that, but I think most of you know me. And I'm here uh, in place of Reverend Carol, who will be back next Sunday, as we've been looking over this year and working from the Happiness Project book. This month, our theme is really about uh, your time is God's time. So this morning, I'm going to be talking specifically about the flexible nature of time. Our goal this month is to have more fun. And so last week, I spoke a lot about parrots and their spiritual wisdom. You have to get the CD if you want to find out about that or watch it on, uh, on YouTube. But we had a good time last week talking about that. And this week, I want to talk about the flexible nature of time. So time, we tend to think of time as a consistent, measurable quality, as something that we understand how it works. We remember the past. We don't remember the future. We know that the now moment is present, but now it's already gone. Now, I want to give you an example of how something that we assume is a particular way might be seen differently by somebody else. So in a famous experiment, the Mian people of Ethiopia were presented for the very first time with photographs of people and animals. But they were unable to read this two-dimensional image that we're so familiar with. They felt the paper. They sniffed it. They crumbled it. And they listened to it. They nipped off little bits and chewed them to taste. But people in our modern world have no difficulty equating that image, that flat two-dimensional image, with a three-dimensional person or animal or object, even though the two resemble each other in a kind of an abstract way. So in a similar vein, in terms of seeing things and assuming something about them, a man who recognized Pablo Picasso in a train compartment inquired of the artist why he did not paint people the way they really are. And Picasso asked what he meant by that expression. And so the man opened his wallet and took out a snapshot. And he showed it to Picasso, and he said, that's my wife. And Picasso said, isn't she rather small and flat? So when the Mian people looked at the shiny paper, all they saw really was the paper with some images on it. But Picasso was able to look at that paper and see the snapshot as distinct from the artifact of what it represented. All right? Are you with me so far? So when we look at time, we experience it as something that is consistent and predictable and measurable. And I want to throw that into question this morning. So originally, before we measured time with clocks, people measured time by looking at the sky and the sea and the earth. They measured it by looking at the days and the seasons and the animals and the way the physical body operated and the way the body of the tribe operated. So they were measuring things by what was physically around them and what they felt inside themselves. It was a felt sense of time. Now, we have done experiments that indicate that, with subatomic particles, that indicate that something that we do in the present could actually alter the past. So that's a new discovery, and it's on a subatomic level. But at the same time, we're looking at something that doesn't operate in the way that we normally think about time. When we experienced time in that way, with a measurement that was connected to everything in the Earth, 
we were experiencing it as Kairos time. Kairos time is felt time. So Kairos, in the Greek world, there were different words for time. Kairos was the sense of the right time, the opportune moment. It might be considered a passing moment when a perfect instant appears and you feel it when it happens. It is a moment that changes everything. It is a perfect moment of ripeness. So it is not the right time of the appointment, it's the right time because it's the fullness of time as it's spoken of in the Bible. Does this make sense so far? So there's a difference between the time on the clock that is exact and the felt time that is right for something. Ernest Holmes, our founder, wrote in A New Design for Living, the spiritual nature of the universe, God, mind, intelligence, from all viewpoints, science, philosophy, and religion, always was, always is, and always will be, without beginning and without end, eternal, immortal, timeless. If we are a creation of that which is eternal and immortal, if we are a creation of God and God is what we are, can what we are be other than immortal and eternal? Now this is what Ernest said, and what I say is, can what we are be other than timeless? So our essence is not bound by time and space. Now isn't that an interesting idea? Mary Morrissey says, some people live 99 years. Others live one year 99 times. <laughs> Timelessness is not necessarily about nothing ever changing, but it is about constantly being in a present that isn't limited only to the present. Let me give you an example. Think about something that has happened in your life that you really enjoyed. Remember where you were, how old you were, who was with you, what the day was like, what it felt like. I see some smiles emerging on some faces. Now let me ask you, is that a past experience or is that a present moment experience that you're having right now thinking about it? And do we know if that moment ever happened? Or if it's something that you are calling forth in this moment and it seems as if it happened before? See how squirrely that is? Okay, so up until the advent of the Industrial Revolution, we were not concerned with the exactness of time. But when the Industrial Revolution happened, we began to have railroad stations and railroad cars. And in railroad stations, we had schedules. And it became important to know what the schedule was for the train. Now, you'll notice in this depiction of a railroad station. This is Waterloo Station in the 1800s. And you'll see that these fellows down here are checking their watches. Now in the railroad station, there are three clocks that are visible. This one, which says it's 9.15. This one, which says it's about four minutes to nine. And this one, which says it's about seven minutes after nine. The problem with this, with railroad stations, was that unless they were completely synchronized, this is a photograph of the worst rail car disaster that ever happened in the United States, and you can see that two trains have collided. Unless they could coordinate their times, unless they could measure it exactly, unless they could coordinate it with accuracy and cooperation, they were not safe. And so they had to find a way to measure time more accurately. So they had to measure the seconds, not the ripeness of the moment, <laughs> but the seconds. You know, if in addition to figuring out those math problems we had in school, if a train leaves Boston at such and such a time and another train leaves Chicago at such and such a time, and they're traveling at these speeds, when will they run into each other? We didn't have to ask the question of, are the clocks synchronized? Because we assumed that they were. 
because that is what has happened over time. We've had to be able to do that. And we've had to be able to do that to make our own lives work better, to make them be safer. Now, we have a new kind of clock. Believe it or not, this is a clock. This is a stromium clock that is at the University of Colorado. Now, a stromium clock is the most accurate clock in the world, and it loses something like a millionth of a second every so many gazillion years. So it's very accurate in terms of measuring Earth time. But because Earth time is related to gravity and speed, if this clock is moved one foot higher, its time changes very slightly, but the way in which it keeps time is affected by the level that it's at. So if this is in Denver, for example, which is a mile high, approximately, that is different than if this clock were measuring time at sea level, and it would have to be adjusted a little bit for that reason. Because as Einstein taught us in his special theory of relativity, the faster an object moves, the slower its time runs compared to the run of time to an outside observer. The faster an object moves. So if something is moving at the speed of light, time passes more slowly for that object than for us here on Earth, because we're not moving that fast. Are you with me so far? OK? So as far as that person is concerned, time hasn't changed at all. It feels exactly the same as it did when they were here. It feels exactly the same to us. But compared to us, their time is passing more slowly than ours is. Time is not consistent everywhere, depending on the speed at which you're traveling. What's also true is that, and this is Einstein's general theory of relativity, that very intense gravity also slows time down. So if you have a black hole where gravity almost increases to infinity, time disappears. Time is so fast compared to the time that we're moving that it disappears. In fact, gravity is so intense where a black hole is, it even sucks in light. So if someone is closer to a black hole than we are, their time is passing more slowly than ours. Are you with me so far? Now, how many of you saw the movie Interstellar with Matthew McConaughey? Did that completely baffle you? This is why. <laughs> because as he left the Earth, he traveled to the other side of a wormhole where time was traveling more slowly compared to us. OK, you with me so far? And as they got closer to that black hole area where gravity was increasing, they went down to a planet, and they left their ship. Do you remember this? The two of them, Matthew McConaughey and Sandra Bullock, they went down to the planet's surface, and they left another guy up in the ship. And they were gone for them on that planet's surface for three hours. When they returned to the ship, 23 years had gone by for him because he was farther, much further away from this gravitational field. So time, our sense of it, does not change. But depending on where we are and how fast we're traveling and how gravity works, it may pass differently for us compared to people who are somewhere else. Are you with me so far? So time, even time that we measure exactly, is not the same everywhere for everyone. Eckhart Tolle said this, most people confuse the now with what happens in the now, but that's not what it is. The now is deeper than what happens in it. It is the space in which it happens. It is the space in which it happens. In other words, time becomes an opening or an opportunity, a context. And events occur within that opening or that opportunity. But if we think of God as not bound by time, then moving forward or backward in time, 
going into the future or back into the past in time, all of that is not only possible, it's all present for God because God isn't bound by it. It's hard for us to imagine that kind of a situation, but actually science is now looking at the possibility that we always assume that what's happening in our life now is affected by what happened in the past, that that's how cause and effect works. We do something in the present and it affects our present and our future. We did something in the past and so that has affected our whole life up until now and our present moment, right? This is even how we talk about cause and effect in the science of mind. But science is looking at the possibility that time might work equally well in the opposite direction so that what we did in the future is affecting us now. That what's happening in our life today might be happening because of something we, we did in the future or something we will do in the future. Now, if we also, in our essence, are timeless, then what we do in this moment can affect not only our future, but also our past. And if we can affect our past and change it, then we will change who we are in the present and our memories of the past. So we might not ever know that we've changed it because we wouldn't remember that we had. <laughs> are you with me here? We might not think that we're able to remember the future, but perhaps we do already. Perhaps we do already. Do you know what you're doing today? How many of you know what you're doing today? You know where you're going after the service? Can you imagine yourself there doing that? Can you imagine seeing those people who are going to that restaurant or doing that? So you're already creating that future, aren't you? You're already there. Now, how do you know you're not remembering it? <laughs> when you're thinking about it now. Do you see? Do you see how tricky this is? So when we think that time and space, Francine is looking very confused at me, when we think of time and space, we think we can position ourselves in time and in space. I think I'm standing here at the Golden Gate Center in the Corte Madera Rec Center on this little platform at 10.34 in the morning on Sunday, May 31st but am I? <laughs> you know, some of science says that form is actually a holographic projection from another universe, which would mean none of us is really here at all. It looks like we're here. We think we're here. How do we know we're here? <laughs> so if time and space is as flexible as it seems to be on the subatomic level, Perhaps we have more opportunities and possibilities than we give ourselves credit for, or than we give ourselves the option for. So when we think, you know, so-and-so did that to me when I was a child, or my parents told me I was this way when I was a teenager, and I've never been able to shake that, isn't that just a story we're telling ourselves now? Isn't that just a present moment experience that we're reinforcing by telling it to ourselves? How do we know that it's true? We only know from our memory, don't we? How do we know that memory isn't a present moment creation? Now, the reason I raise all these confusing questions is to let us know that now is always the moment of power. Now is always the point at which everything begins and ends. Now is always the time that we have ultimate power to make a decision. You know, when we choose to be happy, regardless of what we believe our circumstances are in the moment, we are liberating ourselves from time and space and circumstances. We're saying, I choose to think independently of my circumstances. I choose to emotionally respond independently of what I imagine myself to be in. The age of my body, the circumstances of my finances or my work, my relationship life. Does this make sense? Because 
to some degree, I have to put my attention on those things and think about them in a certain way to claim them for myself. So if I'm not looking at myself in the mirror, if I couldn't look at myself in the mirror, if I weren't looking at any parts of my physical body, how might I describe myself? How old might I think that I was? In this moment, we have choices, but we limit them by assuming what we're bound by. Perhaps we're only bound by the thought we have about those things. Is this making sense? We assume that the arrow of time moves in a particular direction from the past through the present to the future. And yet at the same time, we're in this opportunity to consider more. I came across um, something on the internet, and I'm going to read part of it to you now, in terms of opening our minds to questioning our assumptions about the present moment and what's possible in time and space. And uh, this was written by Thomas McFarlane. It's about quantum mechanics and reality. Now, if I haven't blown your mind so far, I'm going to try again. So he says, imagine going back in time 3,000 years and encountering people convinced that the world is a flat disk. And when you hear this, you tell them they're mistaken, that the world is really round. But you become quite embarrassed when they ask you to prove it to them, and you find that you can't. After all, their experience conforms to the idea that the Earth really is flat. Next, you end up in the year 1495. And in this age of adventurous transatlantic navigation, it's widely known and accepted by everyone that the Earth is round. So having just been unable to give hard evidence to this student, you go to a university and you ask a young astronomy student there to tell you what the evidence is for a round Earth. And he tells you about the recent voyages across the ocean by Columbus and others, and how these voyages are based on the latest navigational techniques and the cosmological theories of the day. The flat Earth idea simply is not consistent with the new evidence, he tells you. And when you object that direct experience tells us that the Earth is flat, he explains that our direct experience is too limited because the Earth is so large and we're normally limited to only a small part of it, the Earth appears flat, although it really isn't. All right, so none of us assumes that the Earth is flat anymore. Our experience is not as limited as it was in the past, he tells you. We can now verify the curvature of the Earth. And then he goes on to tell you in the course of his explanation that the latest cosmological theories assume that the Earth is stationary at the center of the universe. And when you ask him if it's possible that the sun, rather than the Earth, is the center of this universe, he says that would mean that the Earth is moving. And we don't experience the Earth as moving. It would also mean that the Earth is spinning like a top, and we don't experience that either. And besides, we observe that the sun rises and moves through the sky and sets. This is our direct experience, and there's no evidence to contradict it. And once again, you find that you're not able to provide any evidence to the contrary. So we've come to assume that what we've learned is true, even though we don't experience, that the Earth is not flat, and that the Earth is spinning and also orbiting the sun, rather than sitting still. So returning to the present, you go to a local university to find out evidence for those things. And you find that when Galileo developed a telescope and discovered the phases of Venus and about Newton's laws of motion, we began to realize why the Earth was spinning and actually rotating around the sun even though we couldn't feel it. So how can we be so sure that our current worldview is accurate? Might it not be that as we develop more technology, and more ability to measure and look, we will understand more about time and space and discover that our current conception about time and space is limited as well. How many of you have been down to Pier whatever it is in San Francisco where the hologram is? 
You can walk around the hologram and watch the head talking. You can see it from all different angles. Of course, there's not a head in there. We know that. But it looks like there is. It's like a television projection in three dimensions. Well, holographic theory might say that's what we are, too, even though we seem solid. You know, Deepak Chopra says that if you could look at the universe as it is, rather than interpreting vibrations with your five senses, it would look like quantum soup. <laughs> but we actually experience solidity and things with our five senses that allow us to distinguish people and objects. We have no idea if the universe looks like it appears to us. So if we are actually part of the infinite that's not bounded by time and space, this time and space experience that we're having here on Earth is a limited phenomenon that we get to enjoy for a particular period of time, of time, while we're here. And we can measure that time. But we also can lose track of the depth and beauty and richness and possibility of the quality of time, not just the quantity of it. We're very concerned with the quantity of time that we have in our lives. But maybe we need to more, be more concerned with the quality of the life we have. And so I want to share with you a couple of quotes from uh, my book, Coming Up for Air. These are my favorite quotes. And this one comes from the wonderful rabbi, who's now passed on, Hasidic rabbi, Abram Joshua Heschel. And he's making a distinction between the known and the unknown, or maybe we would say chronos time, the measured time, and kairos time, the quality of time. He says, the search for reason ends at the shore of the known. The search for reason ends at the shore of the known. On the immense expanse beyond it, only the sense of the ineffable can glide. So the known has a boundary. Beyond that boundary of the known, we have to glide by feel, by intuition, by the sense of the ineffable. He says, it alone knows the root to that which is remote from experience and understanding. The sense of the ineffable. It alone knows the root to that which is remote from experience and understanding. And then he goes on to say, neither is amphibious. So neither reason nor the sense of the ineffable are amphibious. In other words, they can't either of them travel in the other's domain. Reason cannot go beyond the shore, he says. And the sense of ineffable is out of place where we measure, where we weigh. So when we are too bound by chronos time, we're not able to enter that kairos sense of the ripeness of the moment where we feel into what is happening. You know the moment of electricity when you're attracted to another person that you're falling in love with? Can you tell me what time it was? No, because you were in kairos time, not in chronos time at that moment. So this is an element that we can claim in our lives now that is experienced like timelessness. This now moment of this little boy with his rabbit, this now moment is not about what time is it, but did you have a good time? <laughs> Kairos time, not Kronos time. This is what we want to be able to enter into. And so I want to share with you this final thing from my dear friend Rumi. Let the beauty we love be what we do. There are hundreds of ways to kneel and kiss the ground. And you can't kiss the ground in the future or the past. You can only kiss it now. This moment is the flexibility of time, and it is infinitely yours. Namaste.
now going deeper. So taking that deeper. <laughs> taking that a little deeper. I free myself from the constant measurement of time and open to feeling what's next. Bringing myself present now increases my peace and self-love. So let's take that within. And let's feel the present moment now. If you're uncomfortable anywhere in your body, imagine sending love and light to those places right now. Free that part of your body to be exactly as it is in this moment. And bless it exactly as it is in this moment. In fact, if you can stretch to it, choose it exactly as it is in this moment. Let's expand into the perfection of this moment exactly as it is. Are you hungry? Are you sleepy? Are you irritated? Are you cold? Are you too warm? Are you worried? Embrace it exactly as it is in this moment and imagine that this is the perfect moment that has been created exactly for you in this time and space moment of now completely and perfectly constructed. It is completely and perfectly constructed to support the unfoldment of the spirit. And so we let the spirit blossom, knowing that it is whole, complete, and perfect exactly as it is, and we release our fear of this moment exactly as it is. We let it be welcome. And we know that this moment as it passes into the next moment, is already incrementally changing. And we allow it. We allow it. And we move with it. And we let it reveal itself to us. And so it does. And so it is. And so we are right now. You can open your eyes. So as we prepare for our offering, I'm going to invite the ushers to stand yeah, and come forward. We have some music forward. first. Oh, no, we have music. <laughs> so are we. <laughs> 